All right, I think we're ready. So unfortunately, I am not done cooking yet. Still got some gnocchi to take out. That's right, we're doing Italian dinner and Civil War tutoring session today. So just give me like a little bit of time while I let the rest of you matriculate in here. I hope you all had a lovely evening after your schooling. The gym decided to work out, and I was like, you know what, I'm really hungry. I should totally eat something. So I did, cooking it up right now. Now, I don't know if any of you know gnocchi, but it's uh, little potato dumplings. They're quite delicious. I do recommend. Now, I'm not just eating them plain, though. Oh, no. I am definitely eating them with some delicious shrimp, which will be out here in a few seconds. Now, while we uh, wait on the people that are coming in, ooh, steamy, please know that this tutoring session is only as good as the people who ask the questions for it. So if you don't ask me questions, you're just going to see me eating delicious food and be quite jealous. I mean, look at the steam coming off of my food right now. So, well, we let people matriculate in. We got, what, four people? That's good. That's a good start. I think we had four people to start off the first time we ever did this this year. We'll try to get to at least ten people, and then we'll start the whole shebang up. Let that all work itself out. Still only got two people? It's kind of shameful. Let's see if there's any questions out there. Looks like we got some questions coming in. Apparently, some giant thunderstorm took out some power. That is unfortunate. I, uh, I am apologetic that Mother Nature decided to lay the law down on your house, but I guess get better power. I don't really know what to say to that. You know, Mother Nature can be kind of weird like that sometimes, you know. Sometimes she's just like, oh, we're going to be beautiful, and then North Carolina's going to happen. It's going to be disgusting now. So, looks like our first question, what is the Conscription and Militia Act? Well, when we get to 10 people, I will be sure to answer that question. But in the meantime, I'm going to continue to cook. Now, for those of you who actually don't cook, let me tell you, it is super fun. There's nothing that really makes you feel self-worth than cooking a dank meal. That is correct, dank. Now, in the meantime, I just want to remind you guys, it's all about not just listening to me talk, because as enthralling as that might be, because, I mean, I'm pretty interesting. You wouldn't listen to me if I wasn't interesting enough. Apparently the light in here is garbage, so we're gonna move this so you can all see my beautiful face. That's not working so much. Let's see if I can kind of angle this light a little bit. Ah, uh, still not working for me. Let's see if we can move it a little bit. Ooh, it's still light out. I'm going to open some blinds in here. Okay, not bad. Pretty good. So we're at seven. That's, that's okay. Let's get three more people. Three more people. Come on. We can do it. I'll just sit here drinking my post-workout chocolate milk. I always drink chocolate milk after a workout. It's good for your bones and your muscles. Voila. We have shrimp. Second time I think I've eaten shrimp when doing a Google Hangout. I think it's a consistency. All right, still, still waiting. 
for a couple more people. If no one's here, in the next like five minutes, we're just gonna start. So, how are we only at six people? I told like eight classes about this. This is nonsense. Let's see. All right, I'm gonna go get a fork. I'm gonna come back. We're gonna answer this question. Oh snap, we're at, oh we were at eight, now we're at seven. That's darn, that's darn shame. Potato dumplings, also known as gnocchi. These things will just sit in your stomach, but they are delicious, if cooked correctly. All right, so Militia Act and um, what else was there? Oh, the Conscription Act. Okay, so first things first, Militia Act, 1862. We're talking about the ability to let African Americans join the military. Now, this is a union law specifically. Remember, the Confederacy, not so big on letting former slaves or current slaves have weapons. Think of it this way. Dear sir, enslaved person, we are fighting a war to keep you slave. To make sure that you stay a slave, we're going to give you this gun so you can fight to keep slavery. Give slave weapon. Now go and get the bad guys. Slave holds gun, goes, is this a trick question? Because I kind of want to shoot you in the face. See the case in point. If Southerners were to give blacks guns, the blacks probably would have shot them. And they didn't want another Nat Turner rebellion, so to speak, and another John Brown idea going through about rebellion. So when we talk Militia Act, once again, 1862, we're talking about not only free uh, African Americans in the North being able to fight, but eventually, when the Emancipation Proclamation comes into play in 1863, we're talking about free contraband, uh, freed contraband, not free, but freed contraband, meaning when the Northerners go to plantations and they capture all the slaves and make them work for them. Those slaves are now able to join the military if they're able-bodied. Soon with the Militia Act, we'll see uh, the 54th Regiment, so to speak. They're one of the major, um, they're one of the major uh, brigades, is, so to speak, in terms of letting uh, full regiments. Now, there are no black officers. They still have white officers. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Glory, Matthew Broderick, Broderick excuse me, plays a white officer in charge of a black army brigade, um, the 54th Regiment, which goes to Fort Wagner, and a lot of them die. That's pretty sad. But in terms of heroicness, the 54th is like the prime example. Um, if we're talking about the Conscription Act, that's a little different. Okay, so the Conscription Act, there were two Conscription Acts. The first one is in the Union, and it says any male between the ages of 20 and 35 can be drafted into the military. Okay, seems legit. Kind of like the draft that's still in place today. However, there's one teensy weensy bit of a problem. If you can pay $300 basically only the rich people could, then you didn't have to go and fight. So, say your number gets called. You have to go and fight unless you can fork over $300. Since most people couldn't fork over $300 because they were poor, they had to go and fight. So this kind of went after a bunch of people. It went after the poor, especially in the cities, but it also went after the immigrants, like the new immigrants that just got to the nation, they become citizens, and they're given a draft number. So they're also going to fight. Remember, rich people are eligible to be drafted. They just usually pay to not go fight. Now, the people who couldn't be drafted, those were the African Americans. If African-Americans wanted to fight, they had to be volunteers. 
and put into all black regiments or join the army in terms of like being cooks or servants at first and then kind of getting the training to fight and whatnot. So people got really upset. And unlike going after the government who made these laws, people started to riot and lynch, guess who? The black people. Yeah, makes sense. As a person, it's pretty horrible to think about, but you gotta remember, these people weren't really smart. Their brains didn't really think that way. Um, and so you have to remember, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but because the law has prevented African Americans from being drafted, people got mad and killed them in New York. Now, the second Conscription Act is the one in the Confederacy, and this one was not as enforced as the one in the Union War was, excuse me, because the one in the Union, you had federal troops that were willing to, you know, enforce the law. In the Confederacy, remember, it's a confederation. Each state is different. So if there's a battle in Georgia and you live in Tennessee or Mississippi and you get called to go fight in that battle, well, you're probably not going because you don't care enough to go and no one's going to force you to. Your government's not going to be like, hey, go fight in Georgia. It's going to be like, hey, protect Mississippi. Hey, protect Tennessee. Protect your home state. Don't worry about the other states. And that's the big problem with the Confederation. That's why the Confederacy fails, because everybody's worried about themselves rather than the entire country. And they will eventually realize that that kind of style of fighting will only get them killed when Sherman and Grant come through and just destroy so many people. So there's the two differences. How did the massacre at Fort Pillow emphasize? That looks like a very important question about Fort Pillow. All right. So let me go through that real quick. So Fort Pillow is a really uh, crappy moment in American history. Not so much like our Holocaust or anything like that, but pretty bad. So here's the thing. With Fort Pillow, you have a primarily black brigade, kind of like the 54th, but it's another one. And so what happens is they go to Fort Pillow. They're outnumbered two to one, which is rare for the Union to be outnumbered by the Confederacy, first of all. And so what happens is this guy, Nathan Bedford Forrest, who started this little organization after the Civil War called the Ku Klux Klan. I'm sure you've heard of it. He wants to kind of push this white supremacy onto his soldiers. And not all of his soldiers agree with it. There was many instances where people were not okay with the execution of black soldiers. Because what happens is at Fort Pillow, the black soldiers give up. They surrender. They put their hands out like, all right, we're going to lose. Might as well just give up. Nathan Bedford Forrest is like, kill them all. And people are like, what? But they're giving up. They, they don't, we don't do this. We capture them and we send them to a prison or a war camp, but we don't kill them. And Nathan Bedford Forrest and other people um, that were commanders in the Civil War, this is their rationale. The reason why they treat black soldiers in such an inhumane way is because they don't view them as humans. They don't really view them in the kind of instance that we do now. And the reason for it is because of slavery. They have been slaves forever. They've been property. They haven't been viewed as humans. Dred Scott says in 1857, slaves, black people are not considered humans. They're just, they are property. They cannot sue. They cannot vote. They cannot do a lot of things. And what happens is this kind of rationale goes into the commanders and they're like, this is just basically like dogs. We should just shoot them. And they do. They kill them. They kill them all at Fort Pillow. This is, and this is the kind of rationale that the South is going to use. They're going to be like, well, if we ever have black soldiers who give up, just put two in their head and call it a day. This is dangerous because, once again, not everybody in the Confederacy is a huge racist and white supremacist. Some of them are like, this is really wrong. Like, we shouldn't do this. But here's the problem. If you don't shoot them, then you could be in trouble. Like, you could actually get shot. So it's either shoot somebody 
or face the punishment and probably get shot yourself. It's, it's between a rock and a hard place, and these Confederate soldiers who actually have morals, they're in between there. Now, the treatment for unions, uh, the union soldiers, it, for union black soldiers, the white soldiers, not so much like the nicest of people either. They're not putting two in the back of their heads, though. So I guess, you know, it's a little higher than the Confederate moral or morals. The problem is they are super racist in the North just as much as they are in the South. However, once they see black people fighting, they're like, oh, you know what? They're humans. That's like the light bulb goes, Bing! and it goes, oh, crap. These guys are just like us. They can fight. They're humans. We should like be nice to them. It's odd, right? So you have to remember that this is like pretty primitive in terms of the thinking. Um, and the idea here is that we know that when it comes to how people view uh, the black soldiers, it wasn't really a good thing. It does get better for the Union as time goes on. But then again, I don't think you could be any lower. It's kind of like you were on the bottom floor and now you've gone to the first. So you've made progress. Not that much, but you've made progress. Can you please talk about the most important battles and their significance? Well, you see, the funny thing about battles is that there's a lot of them. Civil War has about 2,000 uh, or, was it 2,000 or 10,000? I don't know, thousands of individual battles. And if I'm gonna talk about those all night, like, I'm gonna be here for a while. So let's just kind of focus on a few of them and if you guys can ask me about specific battles, then I'll know which ones you want me to talk about. Because I'm not going to rip through Fort Sumter all the way through Appomattox Courthouse. I'm not going to do that. It's just, it's too much on me and we're going to not be here. We're going to be just here on an hour just talking about battles. So if you have a specific battle you want me to discuss and its significance, I can definitely do that. I can promise you 100% we can talk about battles as long as you give me a specific one. Not to reject your question. It's a good question. Let's see. Any more, really? Can't really tell if you guys are leaving any sort of comments or not. Nah. <laughs> Let's see. Check my good old Remind 101. See if any of my students are leaving me questions. Do, 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 Sean. Ah, uh, okay, Sean, thank you for the good question. Sean wants to know the 14th and 15th Amendments. Those are very important. You need to know them. You need to know the 13th Amendment, too, and I'll just roll through that one. So the Civil War is a time of progression or... Now, you know what, I can't even say that because it's not really progressive. The Civil War tried to be progressive. We tried to go from here to here and ended up here. And so what happens is with the Civil War and the end of the Civil War, we're going to see three new amendments to the Constitution, which is crazy because three new amendments haven't happened that fast since the Bill of Rights. And what happens is with these three amendments, they are super important. Number 13. With number 13, you have the abolition of slavery throughout the entire country. No more slavery. None in the South, none in the North, none in the border states, none in the territories. No more slavery. Woo, party on, no more slavery. Sounds great. We're like one of the last countries in the entire world to abolish slavery. We're one of the last. Thank God for Brazil, which ironically a lot of the Confederate people went to. If you don't believe me, there are a lot of Confederate supporters in Brazil to this day. Like, they love the Confederate flag in Brazil. I don't know why. Anyways, the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment. We have to look at the 14th Amendment for what it is, and it's a lot. The first thing it does is it defines citizenship. Anybody born within the realm of the United States in any state or territory is an American citizen. That is still present today and gets people really pissy. 
We're not going to talk about that because I don't want us to get anybody upset. But anybody born in the United States is, of course, an American citizen. The other thing it does, it is the Fair Treatment and Equal Amendment. Basically states, it doesn't matter if you're white or black, male or female, gay, straight, whatever you are, you have to be tried and treated fairly. Like if I shoot and kill somebody and I'm white and a male, I have to have the same penalty as somebody who's black or Latino or Asian and does the same thing. It shouldn't matter that I'm a male or white or tall or Italian. It doesn't matter. I should be treated fairly and equally. It's like a rule of law. This is the most important amendment in the Constitution, in my opinion, because it's used so much for Supreme Court cases, especially a lot of them like Brown versus Board of Education, which of course desegregated schools, the Civil Rights Act, it was used to push that. Uh, the most recent gay marriage bill, it was used to push that. The idea is that this is a equal act. And I'm sure that since we live in North Carolina, I'm, I'm sure we'll see the 14th Amendment come around again uh, if the federal government steps in on HB2. But enough of that. Let's go to the 15th Amendment. The 15th Amendment is the guarantee of suffrage or voting for, of course, all men, just men, no women. You get yours in 1919 with the 19th Amendment. True story. We banned alcohol before allowing women the right to vote. We elected a woman to government before allowing women to vote. America, baby, we're the best at making very interesting decisions. So that's the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment. You need to know 13th slavery, 14th citizenship, and equality, 15th voting. You have to know those. Like, if you don't know the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, don't come to school tomorrow. Just don't. It's it's not even worth your time. Like, you're going to fail the test, which I know you won't if you're watching this video, but, like, if you wake up tomorrow and when you're brushing your teeth, which I hope you all do, if you don't know the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, just, you know, <coughs> I'm, I'm sick. I can't come in. I need more time to study these two, three, four, or excuse me, this 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. So, but seriously, don't come in if you don't know them. It's just don't waste my time or any of your teacher's time for that matter. All right, let's take a look and see if we have more questions to answer. This is really good, by the way. Significance of Antietam. That's a good question. Okay, Antietam. First of all, super important battle. Second of all, super important aftermath of the battle. Why is it a super important battle? Well, number one, Lee, General Robert E. Lee, Confederate general, super good at being a general. He is coming up from the south. Remember, uh, you know what? Let me get a map because I'm sure the other classes are much better at maps than my class. My class, when it comes to maps, well, they don't really know what they're doing. And it's not its not their fault. They're just, okay, it's probably their fault. Um, but, you know, it's fine. I trust them to know what north and south is, I think. Um, let's get an overview of Maryland. Civil War. Antietam battle map. Let me find a good map so I can kind of show what's happening here. So background. The war is not going swimmingly for Lincoln. He, he thought that this was going to be like a super easy war. And he's like, oh, I'm so like confident that this is going to work out into my favor and the South will come crawling back. It, it doesn't really work out that way. He gets his, well, he doesn't, but his generals get their butts kicked at Bull Run both times. He loses Fort Sumter. He's, it's not good to be Lincoln. So what happens is, and here's, oh God, it's Hangout Inception. All right, we're here. So Lincoln 
basically sends homeboy McClellan to meet up with Lee. And apparently McClellan, he got Robert E. Lee's plans, like his battle plans. So if you were like playing football and you got a hold of the team's playbook and you knew exactly what play they were going to do every single time, I would hope that you would win the game. And sure enough, McClellan's like, I'm going to beat Bobby Lee. Actually, he said whip. I'm going to whip Bobby Lee. And for the, for the most part, he does. But it's like I said, because he gets the entire plan. So here we go. McClellan's here. Here's Maryland. Lee's coming from Virginia. This is the border between the Confederacy and the Union. And they kind of battle here at Harper's Ferry, and then they progress to Antietam. And Antietam is a huge huge battle. It's the bloodiest day, like 20,000 people die in a day on September 17th. That is crazy. That's like more than people have died in an entire war. Like I think the Revolutionary War, we lost like 25,000 people in the entire war. We lost 20,000 people in one battle. So right off the bat, it's the bloodiest day. The second reason is that we've stopped Lee's invasion of the North. We prevented him from coming into Maryland, which is super important because that means that um, we're fighting a, you know, we're then going to progress back into the South. But the third and the most important effect of this battle is that Lincoln now has the swag to hit him with the Emancipation Proclamation. He needs a victory so that he can be like, okay, and we free the slaves. It's like, you can't make a proclamation like that and not win. If you lost, if they had lost Antietam and then you tried to free the slaves, people would be like, what is wrong with you? you? You don't have any power. You can't even beat a worse nation. And I don't mean worse because the Confederacy was bad. You look at the advantages that the Union had. They had every single advantage, whether it was weapons and industry and railroads and people and oh my God, so many advantages. And yet they were losing because the South wanted it more. And what happened is when Lincoln and McClellan win Antietam, they now have the momentum to kind of make this broad statement, this emancipation of the slaves, which if you don't remember, it doesn't actually really do anything because the president of the Union says all the slaves in the Confederacy are free. That's like Mr. Simpson saying, telling you guys you don't have a test tomorrow you have a test tomorrow, but he can't, you know, it doesn't mean anything. But what happens is that the slaves will, of course, hear that they've been emancipated, so when the Union does eventually come through, they will have no problem leaving their plantations. Okay, so that's the significance of Antietam. So great question, I love it. Do, 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 do. Um, let's see, more questiones, perhaps. None on my remind. That's good. Let's check the YouTubes, the comment section. I don't know what I did here, but I need to figure that out. Nope, that's not it. Oh, there it is. Okay, now I've done it. We're good now. Okay, so now if we go here, we have another question, two new messages. Okay. First, okay, now that we've, <laughs> okay. So now we wanna see, now I've gotten all the battles. God, okay, cool. So we have, um, I'm just gonna go run through the battles real quick. Sumter. The South starts the, um, the bombardment of Fort Sumter, and the Civil War begins. Not only that, Lincoln calls 70,000 volunteers. He's like, we need 70,000 volunteers to crush the Southern uh, Rebellion. And Virginia's like, nah, son, we out. Virginia leaves, and Tennessee follows, and Arkansas follows. And because South Carolina and Virginia and Tennessee have already fallen into that, North Carolina goes, well, I guess we will too. So North Carolina secedes. If you look at Bull Run, the Union gets whipped at Bull Run. It's bad. Like, they were 
initially winning, then Stonewall Jackson is like, no, we're going to do much better than this. And, of course, Stonewall Jackson being Stonewall Jackson, he gets people on his side, and people start to be like really influenced, and they whip the Union at Bull Run. This shows the North, oh, this is going to be a long fight. This ain't going to be an easy one. So that sucks. Next battle. We talked about Antietam. Shiloh. Shiloh is really not that important. You just got to know that Grant is – he's an interesting tactician. He, he's just like, hey, we're the Union. We might not be better fighters than the uh, Confederacy, but we're going to just throw a lot of people at it. And that works. At Shiloh, he just throws thousands of people to their death in this thing called the Hornet Nest where they're just – the Confederacy is just shooting cannons at them, and they're just still running to their death. And eventually the Union wins, and they take the Mississippi River, which is good because they needed the Mississippi River to kind of control the trade because that's how the South – because they didn't have railroads, they used the water systems to get from city to city. <sighs> Gettysburg. Okay. Gettysburg is super important. It is the turning point of the war. It is the bloodiest battle of the war, not bloodiest day. That's Antietam because Gettysburg is three days, not one. Gettysburg, super important for the fact that the that Lee makes the stupid decision again of invading the North. He invades twice. Guess what happens both times? He takes the L, loses, and Lee tries so hard to push pressure on D.C. to say that this war needs to come to an end. And what happens is... He gets his butt whooped. Doesn't help that he had a heart attack the day before the battle. But still, man, don't go to the north. Don't do it. It's like invading Russia in the winter. Why would you do that? Such a bad decision. Does it anyways. Loses. Not only does he lose Gettysburg, he loses a lot of good soldiers, a lot of good generals. And what happens is he won't, like, he's not going to recover from this. He tries to resign. Davis is like, no, dude, it's okay. You'll just, you'll do better next time. He doesn't. And what happens is he eventually retreats to the south, and then Grant comes from the west, and Sherman comes from the south, and Meade is pushing him to the, from the north. And that leads to Appomattox Courthouse, where he, of course, uh, resigns. But before we get into that, let's talk about Sherman's march to the sea. Sherman, being the ruthless man he was, waged total war. And when we say total war, he used everything to kind of destroy the South. He attacked their railroads, he attacked their military, he attacked their civilians, he destroyed property, he went after businesses, he, he, excuse me, whew, he decided to kind of go at the South the way that Hitler and Stalin and other generals would go after enemies and just destroy everything. Basically, he didn't have the ability to bring a bunch of supplies with him so he's like look at all these plantations we can just steal from them and if people like try to fight us we'll kill them because they're just women he knew that most of the men were out fighting so stealing from the women would be like taking candy from a baby and that's what happened he marches from atlanta all the way to savannah burns everything in his way Gets to Savannah, chills for like a hot minute, and then goes all the way up through South Carolina, burns a bunch of cities on the way there. And then he gets to Raleigh, burns Raleigh to the ground. And the thing is, this is the theme. Sherman's burning everything. Grant's just throwing thousands of people at the problem. And Meade is just like, hey, we won Gettysburg. Sweet. So there it is. And then Appomattox, I said it wrong again. Appom I don't know. Appomattox. I, dyslexia sucks, man. Appomattox Courthouse, we see the final battle of the Civil War. Lee tries to get out of Richmond. Grant burns Richmond. There's a theme here. They just love burning cities. And they burn Richmond. Lee gets to the courthouse, and he's surrounded. He kind of surrenders, and Grant's like, nice fight. You can go on home. Doesn't get arrested. No treason. No court-martialing. Nothing. He goes home to Arlington, lives for five more years, and does. Cheers. There you go. All the battles of the Civil War that you need to really know about. Just kind of went through that for you. So I hope that that was what you wanted. Did anybody get drafted yet? I'm missing the NFL draft, and uh, I could win like a thousand bucks if if my top ten is right. So I'd like to know if that that happened.
doing a lot of this teaching thing right now. It's distracting me from my eating. All right, let's continue. Let's see. Nothing on there. Let's go to the Gmail. Already went over and Tatum. Went over Gettysburg. Went over that. Went over that. I feel like I've done a lot of questioning. How do we not have more questions? Am I really that good at teaching? I feel like I'm not. I feel like I'm missing something here. <laughs> yes, I know the comment section you can't leave. I'm still figuring that out. I don't know why. I want there to be a comment box, but I don't know how to do it. If somebody knows how to get the comment box to work, I'd love you forever. Just figure out how to do that. Questions, nothing there. Chat, nothing there. I will one day figure out how to do this thing. I don't know how, per se, but it's going to happen. It's, it's going to work one time. Let's see. Maybe I can alter something. No, I've been chatting a new window. Nope, invalid request. Guess I can't do that. You know, I think there's a little button that, like, there should be a be part of the conversation click here to join the audience. I think that's another way to ask me questions and I would have like a group chat or a questions answer thing. So if you click on that, it might help you. Um, I don't know. I'm still working on this whole thing if you, if you haven't seen it. This is only like my seventh or eighth time. So election of 1864, that's a good question. So let's go back to Lincoln. First of all, he is the biggest enigma of any president maybe outside of Kennedy, because I honestly don't know what he's thinking throughout his entire presidency. I don't. But I think that makes him good or bad. I don't know. Anyways, Lincoln gets elected in 1860. We know. Now, with the election of 1864, he runs up against homeboy George McClellan, which you might know, considering McClellan was his general who he fired. I don't know. That's like, I mean, I can't even think of a way to describe that. Maybe like if you were the vice, are you there? So let's just use uh, the principle of our school. If Mr. Lane fired Mr. Ward and then they were like talking about, you know, you had a like for principal and like Mr. Ward went up against Mr. Lane for like his job. That's how it would be because basically McClellan is Lincoln's like right-hand man for the beginning part of the Civil War, but he's a really bad general. He is really bad. He does a bad job. Like He barely wins Antietam with Robert E. Lee's plans. So McClellan thinks that he is going to take Lincoln from the presidency. He's going to run against Lincoln as a Democrat, and that he is going to stop the war. And people are just like, well, you know what? This war sucks. We are barely winning. There's nothing we can do. The South is trying to seem like their independence means something. Maybe we should just let them be independent. McClellan's like, yeah, let's let them be independent. And so people start to get support. And Lincoln's like, are you kidding me? I'm going to lose to my old general, who I fired. I'm going to look like such an idiot. So then Grant and Sherman go, nah, bro, we got this. We're good. And Grant and Sherman start ripping off huge victories in the South. They start winning huge battles. Like we talked about Vicksburg, which, or we haven't talked about Vicksburg. That was one we missed. Vicksburg. Grant sieges the city of Vicksburg and divides it into, if you ever want to know like that, just think of the letter V. And if you split it in half, it's what happened at the Confederacy. So they, they siege Vicksburg. Grant sieges Vicksburg and kind of starts moving back to the East. Sherman burns the bejesus out of the South, and because of that, when they take Atlanta and they take Vicksburg and they win at Gettysburg, those are three significant victories, and people are like, you know what? Maybe we can win this with Lincoln. And so Lincoln 
crushes in the electoral vote. He won 212 out of 233 electoral votes. That is a massacre of an election. And so he wins in a landslide. McClellan uh, is apparently just as good as a uh, presidential candidate as he was a general, as an awful. And you have Lincoln win the election of 1864, only to be shot, you know, a year and a half later. Sorry, Abe. You tried. So that's the election of 1864. Now I see another question. Do we need to know some of the important women? Ugh, yeah, women are super important. You'll learn that as you go through, JT. Women are always right. But let's talk about Civil War women. Civil War women. Um, you got to know that they were mostly nurses. If they were if they were involved with the Civil War, they were primarily nurses. Dorothea Dix, who is the prison and mental asylum reformer, she becomes the secretary of nurses for the United States Sanitary Commission, the USCS. USSC, excuse me, USSC. She hires Clara Barton. Now, I know that for most of my kids, they still don't understand that. Yes, Clara Barton was a really important nurse, but she wasn't like the top dog. It's like Dorothea Dix and then Clara Barton. You gotta remember, somebody hires Clara. Okay, Clara can't be that awesome Red Cross lady if she doesn't get hired in the first place. Also, funny thing about Dorothea Dix, she hired like not attractive women. So I guess that's what you can say about Clara Barton. I guess she was not attractive because there was a stereotype about nurses, which I guess if you think about, it, if you've ever watched movies with nurses, they are usually attractive. I guess Dorothea Dix was just trying to make a pattern that non-attractive women can also do a good job of nursing. It works because Clara Barton is known as like the angel on the battlefield and she, you know, a couple decades later makes the Red Cross, which of course, they're coming for me. I can feel them, the vampires. Other important women, you know, Sojourner Truth, she uh, kind of helps black soldiers and work, excuse me, works with their regiments. You have Harriet Tubman, who was a Union spy during the war. Um, due to the fact that like she knew the South like the back of her hands and she was running the Underground Railroad. You have Susie King, who's super important to, um, who's super important because she goes from being like a cook to a teacher to a nurse, and then she starts like a school for uh, black people, um, the children during the day and the adults during the night. Um, there's probably more I'm probably missing. You also have to remember that women are also doing what women do throughout the wars and any war. They're working. They're not only taking care of the families and providing as the sole provider, but they're also working in factories. They're also making weapons. They're also working the farms, both the Union and Confederacy in terms of the farms, because the Confederacy, they're the ones who are still, you know, running the plantations. That's why when Sherman goes through Georgia, he's able to take everything he wants because there's like one woman and like 20 slaves who are not going to stop the soldiers from freeing them. It's like, oh yeah, so you need to stop the soldiers because they're going to free you. Yeah, I'm just going to do it from back here. I'm just going to let them come through. So be cool with that. But yeah, that's pretty much all you need to know for women. Primarily nurses, also worked in the factories, also became cooks, washers. Some of them did dress up and fight. There was like 400 or so that disguised themselves, which I know has changed a lot today because women, of course, are on the front lines. But back then, you know, that might not seem like a significant moment in history, but they could have been in a lot of trouble had they be, you know, found out. So, oh, look, it's brighter. I guess if I adjust my brightness of my computer, you can see my beautiful face. All right, let's take a look and keep refreshing these questiones. Uh, la, 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 la. Apparently, Mr. McManus wants to heckle me. Sorry, Mr. McManus, you can't heckle me. I'm not without a comment box, so sorry. Let's see. Ooh, I got a subscription. Sweet. How does Old King Cotton relate to the Civil War? Wow, that is a great question. You must not be one of my students. All right, so, King Cotton. For all of you that don't know, King Cotton is the industry and the economy of the South. It runs the, it runs the show. Cotton is the way things get done in the South. That's why slavery existed for so long. Which, if you think about it, is like kind of ironic because they didn't want to get rid of their slaves because it would have cost them too much 
to get rid of. And to be fair, there was like $4 billion of worth of slaves. So I can understand why they were so reluctant to give them up. However, when you look at the total damage that was done to the South, it would have been way more cost effective to just let the slaves become free. Just saying. Anyways, King Cotton, remember, with cotton, you can't just turn it into t-shirts. You need to like send it to a factory. And there were like this many factories in the South. Now I'm under exaggerating, but not a lot. Remember, the South is primarily agricultural because you grow the cotton, you send it to the North, it becomes t-shirts and clothes and pants and other things, which gets sold all across the world and the country and makes money for everybody. But the thing is, you know, the problem here is that when the war's going on, there's nobody really to work the fields to make sure cotton's being grown. The other place where cotton is worth is abroad. England loves King Cotton because they need clothes and they realize that, you know, the South could be very advantageous if they trade with them and the British can give them guns. So what does the North do? They blockade the crap out of them. They set up a blockade of ships, the Anaconda Plan. They control their port cities of New Orleans and Wilmington and the Outer Banks and Charleston and Savannah. And what they do is by setting up this blockade, it makes it hard for them to trade their good old King Cotton to Great Britain. Now, a few ships got through the blockade. You know, you have these small little ships called blockade runners. They go to Bermuda. They go to Jamaica. They go to Cuba. They meet up with the British and French ships there. And they do their little trade and then they go back. However, it's not enough to sustain an economy. And the economy, which was thriving under cotton before the Civil War, goes down. And what happens when your economy goes down? Your economy loses its monetary value, so inflation goes up because you start printing lots of money. And for some reason, I still don't, I can't get this through my students' heads. When you print a lot of money and your money doesn't mean anything, that makes the prices of goods go up. That's inflation. Think of a balloon. You put more air into the balloon, the bigger it gets, but it's still the same balloon. It's still worth one balloon, no matter how big it is. And so that's kind of how King Cotton, uh, um, that's how it kind of relevates or is relevant to the Civil War. Apparently, the Los Angeles Rams, not the St. Louis Rams, the Los Angeles Rams took Jared Goff. He's going to suck. Not going to lie. I don't see him being good. All right, unrelevant, irrelevant, unrelevant. God, I need to eat. I'm losing my mind. These are not as good cold as they are when they're hot. If you ever eat gnocchi and shrimp, I'm not happy right now. But I'm glad I'm helping you guys. Mm. Effectiveness of the anaconda plan. Um, if you can find an adjective that's like, like super effective, then yes, super effective. Like when you hit a water Pokemon with a thunderbolt and that thing dies, faints, that was the suit. That was the Anaconda. It was super effective by them being able to blockade the entire South. I'm just going to pull up a picture here so that you guys can see just what I'm talking about. Um, the, the South. And there's all that deception again. Okay, um, let's go to outcome plan. Please don't call it the boa constrictor plan. I threw that on as like a joke answer today on one of my uh, tests, and these kids like actually thought it was real, and it made me sad. Okay, so let's take a look. We have the anaconda plan. Notice how it starts in DC, and it wraps its long way around the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. Here's North Carolina, here are the Outer Banks, here's Charleston, here's Savannah, here's Florida, here's New Orleans. And what it's going to do is, its goal is to starve the South by not allowing them to trade. But it's not just the Gulf, it's also the rivers. So they wanna stop the Mississippi flow. And what they're going to do is, they are going to suffocate the South, kind of hoping that with through this asphyxiation, they're able to prevent them from trading. 
and it's super effective. It works so well because the South economy is not industrially based. It's agriculturally based. They can't build ships that are good enough to beat the blockade. Why? Because they don't have factories. And the only factories they had were in Atlanta. And Atlanta burns, well, a third of it burns to the ground. Anaconda plan. Super effective. All right, let's keep going. This is good. We're in a rhythm here. I like it. I'm surprised we still only have like 20 people in this. I thought more people would be in this. I thought with Miss Cox's class and Katz's class. Oh, they're probably not going to watch it because their test isn't done next week. It's probably just all my classes. But hey, I have 140 students and 17 of them are watching. So that's a, that's a small drop off, just a bit. I can't wait for when I do final exam review and we'll get maybe like 50 kids in here crying because they need it. Cult of Domesticity. Peyton, you keep asking me questions. These are great questions. So if we want to talk about the Cult of Domesticity, you have to remember that this is an idea that women can't go out into the big scary world. You know, there's men that just want to like take them away from their families. Women belong in the home, and they're safe in the home, and they, you know, they don't want to be educated because that's terrible. I tell you, man, some people in history. <laughs> Anyways, the cult of domesticity. It's the idea that women should be in the home, that they don't belong anywhere else. And what the point of this cult of domesticity is, is to keep the women in the home so they're not going to work. The thing is, though, that logic bubble that the men put in women's head goes when the war happens. Because it's like, all right, men, we are going to fight the war. All of you, because you're going to get drafted. And uh, who's going to work the factories? Oh, God, all of our poor workers are in fighting, dying on the battlefield. What do we do? We could use the women. Well, they belong in the home making food. Yeah, but they could, like, do both. I'm sure they could, like, you know, they can't do it forever, but they could do it for, like, three or four years. Oh, okay, three or four years, and then they go back to the home once the war's over. Sound good? All right, good. Break. And that idea is the call to domesticity. The idea is that women will leave their domestic household, go work in the factories during the day, come back to the home during the night, take care of the children. And then when the war's over, they say goodbye to their paying jobs, Hey, great job. Thank you for making weapons that helped us win the war. Get back on, you know, the house duty. Baby needs to change diaper. So that's the cult of domesticity. So you keep asking good questions, though. These are great. We've only got about eight more minutes, unless we keep banging off some good questions here. Um, it's okay. I mean, I mean, there's a lot. I know I gave a study guide out. I'm sure, like, Five people might still have it out of the 140 that I, you know, teach. But uh, the union's plan to defeat the Confederate. We talked about that a little bit. I just saw this question. Sorry um, to the person who tweeted at me. I just saw that. Um, what we have to remember is that there were a lot of plans because each general kind of had their own idea. Like Winfield Scott is the guy who does the Anaconda plan. McClellan's like the, we'll just do something. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, Sherman's like, have you ever seen fire? Let's use it. Let's burn everything. And Grant's like, hey, look, people, let's throw them at the war. And Lincoln's like, we must preserve the Union. And then Frederick Douglass goes, maybe we should like free the slaves. That would get a lot of people to fight. And he goes, we're going to free the slaves. We're going to free the slaves. Now we're going to build a wall and make the slaves. No, I'm just kidding. That's not Lincoln. That's somebody else. Anything else? I'm going to go off on a political rampage soon. Do, 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 do. I'm trying to imagine how Lincoln would be like in today's presidency. Somebody who is very wish-washy on his politics, thank God Twitter and the media weren't a thing back in the 1860s because he would be just ridiculed. 
he flip-flopped on so many issues. Man, that guy. I want to go back to school just to think and study about Lincoln. That guy, man. I'm telling you. If any of you go to college for history, somebody do something on Lincoln and then like send me your dissertation. I would love that. Children of mine, I know that you have more questions than this. You guys got way too many questions wrong today on Kahoot. I know that you're smart, but that doesn't mean you don't have questions. So I'm just gonna sit here idly. If you don't have any questions in the next five minutes, I'm bidding you adieu. Or off beta chain. Or Rivaderci. Or Sayonara. Or Das Vidanya. Or Au revoir. Or Ciao. Or Aloha. Or goodbye. If you know any other ways of saying goodbye in other languages, I would love to hear them. I, I need to know more. Do, 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 do. Trying to get more. Ooh, we got a question. Aha. Cult domestic. I think I did not just ask that. I feel like I just answered this question. Yeah, I did. Okay. I guess we're going to stare at my ugly mug for the next five minutes. Seriously, this, this is probably getting a little awkward for people. Uh, it's a good thing I don't feel awkward ever. So is anybody doing anything fun this weekend? Yeah, maybe. No? All right, fine. 26 hurry up we're losing people we're at 14 how are you people still watching if I'm not saying anything hey we got an inbox first battle of bull run we talked about bull run just rewind the video Union loses Confederacy wins it's gonna be a long war because the Union sucks at fighting at first until they get generals who don't have their heads shoved up their butts. You'd be surprised how much better you are at fighting when your head isn't shoved up your butt. True story, you also take tests better when your head's not shoved up your butt. But you guys aren't like that. I know you guys are, you're good. You guys are intelligente. Hey, we got a, got another one here. Nope, same question, bull run. Massacre for a pill, did I miss something here? 54th. Okay, um, Legal Tender Act. Hey, that's a good question. I must have missed that one. Sorry, Taylor. Legal Tender Act. All right, so the union wants to help pay for the war. And so whenever there's a war, taxes go up because the government's like, hey, we're spending a lot of money to do something that a lot of people don't agree with. So the best way to make people support the war is by taxing the crap out of their citizens. Wait, that isn't how it worked? Oh, so yeah, so there was an income tax of 3% that the union uh, puts on, but then they also do this thing called printing money. And we get these things called greenbacks or dollar bills and what the greenbacks do is that they help stabilize the economy a little bit and people are able to stimulate growth by buying things. When you are buying things in an economy, your economy is doing better. That's why whenever people start saving too much money, our economy goes down and that's not good. You always wanna spend your money, which I know is counterintuitive from probably what you're told, but you're supposed to save a little and spend a little. You're supposed to do both. Not supposed to just do one or the other. And so the Legal Tender Act is a union law, and it basically creates money for the union to use during it. Importance of the role of the sea power. Oh, wow. That is a great question. I am so sorry I missed that one. Union naval. Well, here's the thing. You have to know that the Navy was an important, integral part of the Civil War. The thing is, 
there were not that many battles that were significantly important. Like you have the Monitor and the Merrimack and the Monitor and the Virginia. And these are two iron, they're ironclads. This is the end of wooden ships and this is the start of iron ships because when you hit a wooden ship with a cannonball, ball goes poof, 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 and it sinks. You shoot a cannonball at an ironclad, it goes poof, poof, and bounces off. And so sea battles are really effective except they're not because nobody really wins until the South goes, hey, look, submarines, those are things. And then they start using those. Um, so the Monitor and the Virginia or the Merrimack, um, because that's what it was known as, uh, the Merrimack was its union name and then they kind of took it from them and made it a different, uh, a different ship and they called it the Virginia. Funny story about that battle. They fought each other and nobody won, and then they both sank because of a storm. Mother Nature won. Confederate States of America and the United States of America, zero. Um, I wouldn't say you have to know the specific uh, commander because we don't really have to um, know, um, like, you don't really have to know specific people besides, like, Grant and... Uh, like Grant and Sherman and Lee and all them. But like the Navy is important, you know, don't get me wrong, especially the Union Navy, which does most of the blockading and the Confederates really can't, can't hang with them. So it's a great question though. Let's keep, let's keep those questions kind of coming. Oh crap, it's 831. All right, I'm gonna do one last check to make sure there are no questions and I'm getting off because I've spent my hour with y'all. None on remind, closing remind. New message show. Nope, no more from there. Let's go back to the video. La, 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 la. I talked about the 54th Massachusetts earlier in the video, so Jennifer, if you want to go and look at that, I'm sorry I didn't see your question until now, but we did talk about it at like the very first time when we talked about the impact of black soldiers and um, mass executions at Fort Pillow and stuff. So that will be on there. Um, but for the rest of you, thank you for the many of you that have stayed from the beginning all the way to the end. Uh, for the rest of you that will eventually watch this later and don't have to watch me eat or be awkward, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Please, please take notes. If you watch this video once, watch it again and take notes. That is super important. If you have any other questions, you have a half hour to ask me via email or a uh, reminder or anything. But other than that, I am going to go watch television. So you guys have a great night. Tips for going to an exam tomorrow. Number one, go to bed on time. Number two, shut your phone to do not disturb and throw it on the other side of the room. Number three, wake up early and eat breakfast. You might think that breakfast is stupid, but like when you eat, your brain works. It's crazy how energy flows through the body. And finally, remember, you're very smart. Do not second guess yourself. Know your stuff. You'll be fine. Have a good night.